Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Hi, Tim. How are you? Michael, I am doing wonderful. How about yourself from across the pond? <laughs> I'm, I'm doing really well and I'm very jealous because you're in my favorite, oh, would it be my second hometown, I guess, Delray Beach, um, which I've been to many times in my lifetime. <laughs> I have actually lived in eight cities in my adult life as my career has taken me all over the place. And I moved here in 2004. So I've been here for 18 years and I, I'm, I'm like 50 minute walk to the beach. It's, it's, it's great living in Delray Beach. I love it down here, man. It's awesome. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. You're a lucky man. You're a very lucky man. Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> Tim, um, let's get started uh, with our conversation. And why don't you start by telling us how everything got started? <laughs> you know, share with us your story and how you got to where you are today. So I'm going to okay. hand it over to you. So first, we're going to obviously discuss marriage uh, for anybody watching this that's wondering what we're about to talk about. And uh, to begin the conversation, I start off by saying I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a trained psychologist. And when you understand what that means, that actually turns out to be significant. Um, in fact, I was raised in St. Louis. Um, my dad was a cab driver, so we were raised poor. I'm just Tim. Nobody, I mean, I, I come from, you know, from a, a rather poor family. In fact, when I was 12 years old, I told my mom I wanted to be a Catholic priest when I was 12 years old. And then, and then I discovered girls, so that old career path kind of got derailed. <laughs> yes. But I happened to do well in school. So I have an engineering degree. I spent nine years in the telecom equipment industry. I went back and got my MBA, and I landed on Wall Street as the first semiconductor analyst on Wall Street to focus on the communications market. Wow. And one of the reasons why I say that is I'm obviously very analytical. I call it, I'm analytical. <laughs> okay. I am what they call a nerd. Right. Okay. But at the height of the market working on Wall Street, it was actually a girl that I had known for about eight years. We were in the same circle of friends in Dallas, except mm -hmm. she always had a boyfriend. I always had a girlfriend. But we got together when we weren't seeing anybody else and we fell in love. And as anybody knows who's done this, it happens very quickly when you meet the right person. And there's a reason for that. I actually explain psychologically what happens to two people when they fall in love. But we met, fell in love, very easy, very quickly. We're going to spend the rest of our lives together. And then we started fighting. Yeah. But more importantly, when we went to the therapist, and the therapist wasn't helping. Wasn't. That's what the therapist wasn't helping. No. Okay. When you understand the psychology industry, you know why that's the case. But that is what motivated me to do this. In fact, in the psychology world, it's called a double bind. A double bind is when you look right, you run into a wall. And when you look left, you run into a wall. And that, that is when people go crazy. And my only outlet, I, this was so painful. I guess I'm just more sensitive than most people. But it, this yeah. breakup was so painful for me. And then just the bizarre reality that I was paying a professional who was supposed to be helping my relationship problems. And the fact that this professional didn't know what he was doing is what motivated me to do this. So I spent nearly two years researching and writing my book. I spent 10 months reading a hundred books, wow. probably one of the most researched books ever written. And then I moved to Costa Rica, dyed my hair blonde, wore an earring, lived a bohemian lifestyle. And I wrote the book. It took me nine months to write the book. Right. Okay. And so just to give you a sense on the significance of the book, just to give you a sense of the significance of my message. Have you ever heard of Carl Jung? Yes. Okay, so for anybody watching this who have not heard of Carl Jung, Carl Jung was 19 years younger than Freud. Freud looked up to Jung so much, he considered him not only his heir apparent, his replacement, but he also considered him his son. And as we know, Freud's basic theory is that sex is what motivates us. It's not true, but it's what Freud said. 
And it's still the biology conclusion that's the foundation of the industry today. This is why the psychology industry gives behavior advice, because they still believe that we are an animal, incapable of thinking. Conventional science has long held the belief that the mind is an illusion, a side effect of the electrochemical activity of the brain, which is why whenever you hear a professional psychologist or psychiatrist talk about the brain, serotonin and dopamine, neuron and synapse, uh, bipolar, chemically imbalanced. Yes. Anytime any professional mentions the brain, what they're basically telling you is that you are an animal incapable of thinking, which is why they use the how does it make you feel question, known as cognitive behavioral therapy, instead of how does it make you think, which actually solves the problem. So when I realized that was my biggest resource was auto, uh, Carl Jung's autobiography, which I read nine times before I was able to summarize it in my book. I'm actually advancing some of Carl Jung's concepts. So the point is when I realized how very little effort the professionals have put into solving the marriage problem, that's why I'm doing this. My mission is to lower the divorce rate. My mission is to actually bring back our culture of marriage so that we put it at the priority that it's supposed to be, which is number one, not the bottom. <laughs> yeah. This is where most people put their marriages. So thank you. I love that introduction. And obviously, there's a huge amount of questions come up in my head as you were speaking. And the first one being, um, when you split up with that girlfriend, um, was just to clarify, is it was it then that you decided to research it? And write the book or did it's, it come it, later it, it, that's that's exactly that point i'm a wall street analyst and if anybody doesn't know or what anybody doesn't know what a wall street analyst does a wall street analyst studies industry yeah okay so i've been trained to study industries right i can spend i can literally spend the rest of this interview telling you how your phone works <laughs> yes i won't but i could and so i realized that i have a skill set nobody in the history, well, no, this isn't true. I won't make this aggressive with a statement, but we have not, in the modern era, analyzed the efficacy of the psychology industry. Nobody's ever done that. Yeah, and that's I have, what I'm doing. I've seen somebody do it. Okay, so you have seen, so, I, and I know there are people that have been critical of the psychology industry, but what yeah. I've basically done is I have studied the psychology industry. I've got my head around the industry. For example, therapists are trained to be emotional, not logical. That, that's one of the biggest things that I've realized. Right. Therapists, psychologists are not trained to be logical. That's not their, their focus. Their focus is emotional. And let me give you an example. Let me mm. give you an example that I use. That's a bold statement, so I want to verify that. Yes. So one of my favorite quotes to demonstrate the, the depth of the psychology industry actually comes from Dr. Phil's book. Okay, it's called Relationship Rescue. Here's a verbatim quote from Dr. Phil's book. In the 25 years I have been doing work in the field of human behavior, I have seen few, if any, genuine relationship conflicts ever get resolved. That is a verbatim quote from Dr. Phil's book. Now, when somebody who's logical reads that, they're like, that makes absolutely no sense. What the hell is he writing a book for? He can't help people solve problems. But when you're reading that emotionally, because remember, most people read relationship books because they're emotionally traumatized because their yes. relationship is, is ended. And then they go and tap into these books relationship books of which i read two dozen of them by the way relationship books describe problems they don't solve them behavior right. advice doesn't work so so reading those books you just get more confirmation of what you've done wrong <laughs> exactly exactly yeah. yeah that's what they do it, it, the, the, the format of relationship books are all the same john and jane doe don't get along here's what you're supposed to do about it from a behavioral perspective that's that's the theme of virtually every relationship book written by professionals it's behavior right. advice yeah. It's the same way you treat you treat your pets. That, that's the way professionals treat us. They, the same way, sit, lay down, roll over. This is behavioral advice. This is what you do when you're training your pets. Okay. Okay. And <laughs> exactly. So <laughs> when when that one relationship you had, right? I, I'm just interested why you felt it necessary to then kind of go and dive into it very, very deeply without having experimented with a few more relationships. 
to begin with? Well, the pain of that relationship brings up the question that everybody asks when they're breaking up, and that is why. Yeah. Why did this relationship end? Mm. And that was the only way I could figure, I mean, this is, I am an engineer. I have been trained to be an engineer, and then I'm trained to be a Wall Street analyst. So engineering trains you to solve problems. Wall Street analyst trains you to be analytical. Mm. Okay. In every, and you know, this isn't the only relationship I've had. I've had other relationships before this one. But the point is, is, is I have never been the judgmental type. That's how most people are in relationships. And there's fear and insecurities that, that motivate that. But I've never been the one that when my, you know, when, when she's doing wrong in my perspective, I'm sitting there going, she's wrong. She's just, I'm judging her. That's the way most people respond. The way my mind always goes is there's a problem. Let's solve it. It's the way I've always been even yeah. in, in, in relationships. So when I'm in a relationship and there's problems, my mind's always going to solve it. That is, that is how engineers are trained. Yeah. And then when I, and so, yeah, I didn't realize how inefficient the industry was until I got my head around it. But my whole point was, it was my cathartic response. The only way I could heal from this, okay, was taking right. on the subject. Was, was, you know, it was like, you know, I have a special skill set. And that skill set I could use to benefit other people. It's the pain of this breakup. Mm. It is unbelievable mm. how painful divorce is and how yes. much it crushes the, the marriage, the couple, the children, and society. Yeah. The impact of divorce in our culture is hard to estimate how much that drags our culture down. Mm. And there's no help out there. In fact, let me let me let me give you this as an example of of what is happening in our culture today. Okay, so Carl Jung and, and Freud are analyzing artists. Okay, to try and figure out the motivation for the artwork. So let me give you right. an example. There, there's no example, so I'm making this example up. So Leonardo da Vinci painted the Mona Lisa. Yeah. Okay. So what Freud and Young are doing is they're, they're analyzing why Leonardo da Vinci painted the Mona Lisa. Right. And Freud's response was that everything was sexual or psychosexual. Right. Okay, Young referred to it as the monotony of interpretation. Number one, the first point is Leonardo da Vinci was most likely gay, which is why I use his, his painting as an example. There was no sexual motivation for Leonardo da Vinci painting the Mona Lisa. It's not true. Right. But Freud said it, the industry still follows it. And Jung looked at Freud and said, your hypothesis carried to its conclusion condemns our culture. Mm. And Freud's response is, so be it, thus is the fate we are faced with. What the psychology industry is doing is promoting the regression of our, of our culture because it's better for business. Mm. Okay, so that is what Young, Young, Young theorized when he was realizing what Freud was saying and what, Freud, what he said Freud would do actually happened. I, I am, and I'll get into this more in, in a bit, but I'm the founder of one of the largest marriage groups on Facebook. It's called the Marriage Support Group. Okay, we, we have about 30,000 comments a, a month on my, in my group. 30,000 comments a month in my group. Wow. And about half of the conversations are about sex. Yeah. Okay. Because the other grand conclusion of Jung was that Freud, what he literally said, it was replacing a God from above with a God from below. But what Jung is saying is that Freud replaced religion with sex and that psychology is not a science. It's a religion. Mm. Okay. So these are, these are huge, huge uh, realities of what Jung realized Freud was doing with the psychology industry. And here I am 100 years later saying, in fact, what Jung said turned out to be true. So the psychology industry actually promotes mental illnesses. They promote suicide. They promote depression. They promote divorce. I saw a therapist business card once, and her business card said that she was a marriage and divorce therapist. Yes. You have to be Yeah, kidding. I've met somebody like that as well. Yes. Exactly. It's ridiculous what the psychology industry is trying to feed us. Yeah. In fact, let, let me let me tell you, and I don't want to stay on the psychology issue. That's not the point of this. But let me let me give you my example that I use, and then I'd like to move on past the psychology industry. Yes. So I recently discovered that the psychology industry is actually labeled when the seasons change 
a disorder. And they call that disorder seasonal affective disorder or SAD. Yeah. So when you're sad now, because the seasons are changed, you need to see a therapist. And I was joking to myself when I saw that. And I was like, this is unbelievable what this industry is doing. They are actually going to come up with a disorder for happiness. Yes. They're going to make happiness a bad thing. And believe it or not, Michael, they have. They haven't claimed it a disorder yet. It's called toxic positivity. They are now claiming that when you are happy with yourself, that's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Is it, I, you know, there's a very fine line between psychiatrists and psychologists. <laughs> I always believe that psychiatrists are the ones that give you the tablets, the pills. And the psychologists are the ones that keep you in therapy uh, for years, for decades. Well, let me, um, let me, if I could, let me explain that, if I could. Yeah. Okay. Even though Jung and Freud had their famous breakup in 1912, when Freud died in 1939, Jung still looked up to him. Jung referred to Freud's work as epic making. And what he said Freud did was Freud introduced psychology into psychiatry. Because it's important to understand when I go through my conversation that when Freud and Jung got started and everybody else got started, there was no psychology. There was no try and figure this out. No. There was stick an ice pick in the ice socket and do a frontal lobotomy, lobotomy by separating the frontal cortex, which is where we think that is the medical approach to mental problems. That is psychiatry. And by the way, that has as its roots a French philosopher in the 18th century by the name of Descartes. It's spelled Descartes, and it's called Descartes duality. Descartes duality, what he did was he gave the mind to the church, and he gave the brain to science. And so the biology conclusion that, because what, what Freud did was Freud introduced psychology into psychiatry, but what Freud did is he introduced biology into psychology. He did not introduce psychology into psychology. Psychology is not psychology. Psychology is biology. Okay, right. Jung is the one that figured this out. Jung is the one that introduces psychology into psychology. And what I mean by that is, for example, Jung healed schizophrenia. Right. Okay, have you ever seen the, mutant, the movie A Beautiful Mind with Russell Crowe? I have, but a long time ago. A long time ago. Yeah, it's an older movie. But in that movie, he goes crazy. He's a math genius. And he starts seeing people. He has friends that he sees that aren't there. That's the theme of the movie. That is the biology perspective of, of schizophrenia, that you're actually going to see things. Yeah. Okay. Young healed that. Wow. Young, young healed that. He got, because what he did is he got to the root causes of our mental problems. That's what's missing in the psychology industry. Where is the source of the mental problem? And that's what root causes. I'm going to put a neon light on the back of my wall, and that neon light's going to say root causes. If you're not looking for root causes of mental problems in your sessions with people you're working with, you are wasting your time and their time and their money. But that's not what they do in therapy. No, no. Okay. So anyhow, okay. moving on. Let's get let's get to what I'm let's... doing now instead of the whole. Okay. Psychology. Okay. Okay. This. Brilliant. Tell us then, what are you doing? So here, if, if we were to canvas unsuccessful relationships, there is one and only one character trait that you will find present in almost every relationship that is ending. And that one character trait is control. Okay? Relationships end because one or both are trying to control the marriage. Wow. What I, in essence, do is I eliminate the power drive within a marriage. I eliminate either of their need to control the marriage. Arguments are control mechanisms. Mm. Okay. Michael, you're such a jerk. I am now trying to control this relationship because you and I are having a conflict that I can't get you to agree to me in a logical manner. So now I'm going to resort to forcing you to agree with me. And I'm going to start yeah. calling you names. I'm going to start arguing with you. I'm going to start telling you you're wrong, I'm right. And that's called an argument. An argument is I'm right and you're wrong. And your response is you're right and I'm wrong. 
There's yeah. no logic in the arguments. Once you do to argue with a person who has abandoned the use of reason is like administering medicine to the dead. <laughs> Check that one out. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Once you go from disagreement to argument, you're done. And there's no, there's no way back from that? Of course there is, yeah. What I do is I teach the relationship between fear and anger. Right. Where there's anger, there's fear. And do you want to focus on the anger, which is the behavior, or do you want to focus on the fear, which is the character trait? We, our behaviors are based on our character traits. Our character traits are belief systems. So, for example, I'm a nice guy, which is true, but I don't think that about myself. But I behave accordingly. I open doors for people. I say nice things to people. That's my belief system. My belief system is my character traits, and that is what motivates my behavior. And once you understand the relationship between your beliefs and your behavior, you focus on the beliefs, not the behavior, and then you solve the problem. Our mental problems, by the way, and this is the first time you've ever heard this because I'm the one that figured this out, but our mental problems are prejudices. Our mental right. problems are prejudices. Every problem in a relationship, listen to this one, Michael, every problem in a relationship, every single one of them is a limiting belief. I understand limiting beliefs, 100%. Exactly. And yeah. that's what causes problems in relationships. You are not a bad person, regardless how much you think that. God does not make mistakes. Right. Yeah. So that's and what I'm doing. I'm te teaching couples conflict resolution. How do you solve the marriage problem unless you solve the marriage problems? Here's one of my favorite ones. This one's funny. The reason why relationships are successful is because couples get along. The reason why relationships are unsuccessful is because couples don't get along. It's that simple. Yes. You want to solve your marriage problem, solve your marriage problems. <laughs> and the other thing I found out, this is, this is also fascinating, is I found out that most marriages have one problem. Sometimes it's different for the husband and the wife, but most marriages, there's one problem. And when that problem doesn't get solved, you start to build an onion. Okay, so for example, let me give you an example. I'm working with this couple now where the husband expects sex every night. Expects sex every night. And when he doesn't get it, he gets angry at his wife. So they got into a fight last week over cheese. Yeah. Okay, they wanted different kinds of cheese, and that led to a fight. And that fight had nothing to do with cheese. No. That fight had to do with the fact that they can't get their issue, their sex issue taken care of. And that's what I'm hammering him on, on why he thinks he needs to have sex every night. Yeah. Not that there's a problem with that. I have actually been in a relationship where that was our, our, our intimacy. That we were, but it wasn't something that was forced. It was just natural. You know, we just came together all the time. Okay. And because it, it's because I, and this is why I was telling the wife, it's not, the, the issue is not sex. The issue is control. Yeah. Okay, sex is the vehicle the husband is using to try and control the wife. And once I can get him to, to let go, where there are no distinctions, there can be no superiority. Perfect equality affords no temptation for abuse or control. That's the, one, that's the quote I have people put on the refrigerators. When you give up control, there's no potential abuse or control when you give up control. There's no temptation for abuse or control when, you do, when, you, when your marriage is based on equality. So do you know why one of the one of the 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 what's the word for it? one of the individuals in the marriage <laughs> um, wants to have control? Because in the beginning, there was no control. You know, there was whatever you want to call it, dopamine and serotonin and... No, that's love. not what you call it. In the beginning, you have what's called the anima and the animus, which these are, these are unconscious motivations for a guy to meet a girl and a girl to meet a guy. That's what happens at the beginning, is okay. two people are unconsciously looking for each other. And there is lust and, you know, and it may start all about sex. It's and called then... the false facade is what you're describing, Michael. It's called the false facade. People always put their false facade... Uh, forward when they get, when they meet because you're trying to put your best foot forward which is natural yeah yeah so in the beginning it all looks great and right. then then somebody once said a quote to me 
or I read it somewhere that says, the more you see of someone, the more you see of someone. Of course. <laughs> and you get to know each other. <laughs> yeah. And, and is it then that things start to fall apart or when does control start to show up? Well, arguments is what starts to show up. Hmm. And arguments are control mechanisms. Right. And what happens when that shows up is when you finally get comfortable with somebody to be able to reveal your true meaning, your true intentions, who you truly are. Right. Okay. Because, and because here's the other big point that I make when I, when I work with people. The biggest influence in your marriage is your relationship with your parents. Yes. Because that's where you first learn about love. The only reason why I could say I've solved a marriage problem, the only reason why I have any foundation for making that statement is because I forgave my parents when I was 25 years old. Mm. And I went through that cathartic release of my childhood. Bear in mind the bar mitzvah and bat mitzvah in the Jewish tradition, the first communion in the Christian tradition. I'm in South Florida. There's a lot of Latinos down here. The quinceanero, and I always mispronounce that. In the Latino tradition, these are initiation ceremonies into adulthood. Yes. But they are set up for us to go through these when we are 12 years old, which in the old days, that's when we started on the farm when we were 12. That's when we became adults. Now we don't become adults until we're at least in our mid-20s. Yeah. So these traditions are no longer effective, but what they are, they are initiation ceremonies into adulthood. A balanced ego is not when you are better than anybody else. A balanced ego is when you're better than you used to be. That is the billion dollar question that you know, <laughs> this is how bizarre this gets, Michael. Adam and Eve were not the first biological human beings on earth. Adam and Eve were the first psychological human beings on earth. Adam and Eve actually invented irrigation in Mesopotamia 8,000 years ago. That's why the Bible states that the earth is 8,000 years old because of what when Adam and Eve actually invented irrigation and they created the first civilization, the Sumerians of Mesopotamia in modern day Iraq. Babylon was close to Baghdad. They've actually finally figured out where Babylon is. Right. They figured out the foundation, they've discovered the foundation of the, of, of the power of Babylon. Okay. And so the point is, is Adam and Eve discovered thinking. Wow. The reason why we have consciousness is our ability to think. Before Adam and Eve, we were emotional human beings. And women were in charge, by the way. We were matriarchy before Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve started the patriarchy movement. With Adam and Eve, the church took over. And we know the church is all patriarchy-based. The church, the message, one of the biggest messages of the church is the man is in charge of the marriage. That is one of the underlying themes yes. that you get from the Catholic message. Okay, But the point is, what else happened to Adam and Eve? They discovered they were naked. Okay, mm. and they got dressed. The ego was born with Adam and Eve, and we have been trying to figure out how to balance our egos ever since. Because remember, until democracy, prejudice was a good thing. I mean, you're in England, for heaven's sake. There's no greater example of, of, of uh, prejudice than Europe. Europe is England versus France. I'm a history fanatic, and you know, look at the history of England versus France, you know. You go to England, France is bad. You go to France, England is bad. That's because those two countries have been going back and forth literally since, you know, the, the fall of the, of the Roman Empire in the fifth century. England and France have been going back and forth to figure out who's in charge. And so, and then religion promotes prejudice as well. You know, yes. the whole Catholic Jewish thing that we know about. So, um, so the ego is what we're, we're trying to figure out how to live with ourselves. One of the biggest things I teach is to teach people how to like themselves. The one person you spend the most time with is yourself. And the first step in a successful marriage is you have to be happy with yourself first. If you're not happy with yourself, that's when these things start coming out. Right. It's when the relationship okay. starts to get comfortable. Because I, I, I've, I've learned a lot from you today, and it's also <laughs> bringing up a lot of other thoughts that I've had over the years. Um, I've only had, and it only it will be only one, one failed marriage. Um, and I'm in a very it, it, happy see, Just listen, listen, listen to what you just said. I've yes. only had one failed marriage. You realize that there are people that get a, a, an ego boost when they get divorced because they feel like they're in the club. 
I know. I know. If you're not divorced, you haven't lived. Are you kidding me? Where, where is our culture of marriage with that belief system that's dominating on so many people? Martin, Martin Luther King was once asked what he thought was a problem with, with marriages, and his humble response is, oh, I don't know. I think they don't know each other very well and are afraid. That is the foundation of problems in marriages. We become afraid of our spouses. Yeah, yeah. But I think I also believe that people look at their partners, spouses, their relationships to fix themselves, you know, so they they push the responsibility onto the other person that you they just said have... two different things. Fixing right. themselves is different than pushing the responsibility on the other person. The negative ones push the responsibility on the net on the other person. The positive ones use it to fix themselves. Yes. Okay. Well, go into a relationship to fix themselves. Yeah. What you're How supposed to learn, which is here's the point. What you're supposed to learn about marriage and relationships. This is the big key. This is the thing that changes the relationships dynamics forever. Hmm. Okay. The Chinese have a saying, and that saying is that history is a mirror. One of the biggest things that I teach people is to get to know themselves. And when you get to know yourself, you are just an aggregation of every experience you've ever had. That is who you are. Yes. But in order for you to, re to, to, to know yourself, you have to go through and recall all those things. I had a guy tell me once he doesn't remember anything from his childhood. That is, that is so sad. Mm. Okay. But the point is, is you have to get to know yourself. What happens when you look in a mirror, you see yourself, your spouse, is a mirror and once i get people to go from this to this once i get people to go from blaming their partner to looking at what that means to them and look at it from their perspective i've changed the dynamics of the marriage forever mm. because because what happened it is this is one of the things i tell couples all the time the reason why you were arguing is because you love each other you know, th think about this, Michael. And again, you and I are two guys and, you know, we obviously like girls. So you and I aren't in a romantic relationship. So if you and I get in a conflict, it's logical. You and I yeah. are business partners and I'm the accountant and you want to buy a $5,000 computer and we can't afford it. We now have a problem. But yeah. how do we solve that problem? You and I are emotionally connected. So you're going to look at my side and I'm going to look at your side. Right? You're going to ask me, what do you mean we can't afford it? I'm going to ask you, what do you mean you need a $5,000 computer? You're not going to sit down and have a meeting. We're going to discuss the computer. You want it. I say you can't have it. Well, how, how do we solve that? And when we solve that, we come to a solution. It's called compromise. But the biggest thing about compromise and the biggest thing I teach when I work with couples is understanding the other person's perspective. Okay? Yeah. You and I are having a logical conversation. I can see why you need a $5,000 computer. You can see why we can't afford because you can yep. see my side and I can see your side because there's no emotional component other than the fact that we're business partners and we want our business to succeed. Mm. But romantic relationships are so much more emotionally intense that it's so much more significant. The goal is to make conscious what is unconscious or else it appears is fate. If you are afraid of something happening in your relationship, it will happen right you are going to manifest what you were afraid of happening in your relationship unless you saw it yeah okay yeah. that is the point and so getting people to look at themselves as opposed to blaming their partner is a critical step in bringing two people together for life that's very profound and very true. I 100% agree. What and I'm I saying think... is, is, listen, I've done my work. I'm, a, I'm an analyst. <laughs> 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 I, I have literally put more effort in trying to figure this out than anybody I know. Let me put it that way. I don't know anybody that's put the kind of effort that I have in figuring this, 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 this problem out and then solving it. And so I, I, I still, one of the questions that come up comes up listening to you is that is great that you're an analyst but not everybody is right so right. everybody comes at it from an emotional standpoint right 
and that's their kind of reaction to an argument mm -hmm. well he's he's wrong she's wrong i'm mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. I, i'm not going to give in i'm not going to compromise because i know i'm right type right. of thing and when both parties are just so fixed on their point of view how do you help people to get past that well, the, the, what, I, what I discuss, what I explain, and, and again, what I'm doing is I'm making people aware of their marriage. Because the one word you just said in that question was react. Mm. Most marriages are reactive. A problem comes up, people react. Yeah. Okay. You and I are in business together. We're going to plan. <laughs> You think we're going to go and we're going to have some competitor comes out with something better than us, then we're going to react? No, we're going to figure that stuff. Where you and I are going to work our butts off to make sure we're prepared for anything that's going to happen that could affect our, our business. Yeah, Couples don't do that. People don't prepare for their marriages. And that's what I'm doing. And the big point that I make, I call this the hierarchy of the argument. There's a process that we go through that leads to an argument. It begins with an insecurity, which is a fear and anxiety. Say your parents got divorced, for example. That's always the example I use because it's so clear. Yeah. So if your parents got divorced, you now bring that fear into your marriage and you've created what I call a relationship prejudice. A relationship what? Prejudice. Prejudice, right. We know racial prejudice. We know gender prejudice. We do not know relationship prejudice because nobody's figured that out yet. That's what no, I've never heard of it before exactly. until you've That's mentioned I mean. it. I have figured yeah. out that our mental problems are prejudice. Remember, our biggest mental influence is love. Love is more profound than how much money you make. Mm. Love is more profound than how big your house is. Yeah. But we put our how much money we make or how big our house is over love. And that's where we get screwed up mentally because we've got our priorities all screwed up. We're not putting priorities in the right place. But the point is that relationship prejudice is what leads to people being judgmental, which then leads to anger. Yeah. And so what I'm doing when I conclude this section is, again, I'm relating fear and anger. Hmm. So problems come up when you go from disagreements to anger. Again, once I call you a jerk, we are done. We have no conversation. But what you're going to do, this is what I teach couples in my seminar, is you're going to ask me in, in our relationship, what am I afraid of? And what that does is it pulls me from that emotional state. Because remember, something you did pissed me off. Something you did triggered me. Yes. Okay. And so that trigger gives me a response back to you of, of emotional. You know, how dare you say that to me, Michael? You're, so, you're such a jerk for saying that to me. And so it's my fear that's motivating me to respond in a judgmental fashion when you do something that I perceive as wrong. Yes. And so the question is, again, do we discuss the anger? Which is, you're a jerk. Why did you do that? That's what people are doing. Now you and I have an argument. You know, how dare you call me that, Tim? What are you doing? And now we're focused on my anger. But the reality is, is it's the fear underlying my anger that we should be focused on. Because what's yeah. so fascinating about it when you go through this thought process is my fear has nothing to do with you. No. no, my of fear is not. something from my past. Yeah, but that's my point. You're arguing, you're arguing with somebody that has nothing to do with the problem. Because Michael, Michael's not my problem. I yelled at Michael. I called him a jerk. But Michael's not the problem. My problem is my background that that caused me to have whatever belief I had that Michael just triggered when he said whatever he said to me. He triggered some nerve inside of me. And remember how emotional are relationships, right? They're very emotional. They're, they're huge. Yes. Emotions. Right? Yeah. And so you're in, in fact, most relationships are unconscious. Mm. Most relationships are unconscious experiences. People are in, in, in the beginning, it's unconsciously bliss. And then at the end, it's unconscious misery. Yeah. And going to court and. <laughs> and then you get into that whole process. And oh then showing it on TV when you're a celebrity and yeah, getting it all out in the open. And oh yeah, we well, I don't want to talk about Johnny Depp and Amber Heard, but that is that is an unbelievable thing. I can't believe those two did that for themselves. Those are the dumbest people on the planet at this point. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Wow, there, there is, you know, there is it's really interesting because. I've always said that there is no handbook, is there? When there is now. There is now. You've got it. Yeah. 
So tell us more about the handbook then. Well, what I'm doing in, in my book is I'm using examples of history to demonstrate my point. Right. Okay, so let me give you the most extreme example that I use. Okay, this is the shocker. This is the one that, that beats the last remnant of control out of a relationship. Okay, in fact, the cover of this book is described as more profound and disturbing than Anne, Frank, Anne Frank's diary. Wow. This is a book called I Shall Bear Witness that was only finally released to the West when, when the Berlin Wall fell, it was actually kept in, I think, whichever one was it's the communist side, West or East Germany, whichever one was the communist side, it was kept there. And it's, it's a story of a man by the name of Victor Klimperer and his wife, Eva, surviving Dresden, Germany during World War II. And he wasn't even Jewish. He converted to Protestantism to marry his wife because she was Protestant. But Hitler declared that if any of your grandparents are Jewish, you were Jewish, making it a race, not a religion. And, and Victor and his wife lived in public during the entire war and right. they survived. And this is his day-to-day -day memoir, okay? And so what I'm doing is I'm describing, what are the things, for example, here's the example that I use. I'm a music fanatic, I love music and it's all alternative rock, U2 and Dave Matthews and I just discovered a new band that's that I fall in love with. But the girl that, I, that led to this, she was a classy girl, she loved jazz music. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but she didn't allow me to listen to my music. Yeah. And so I gave that up because for whatever reason, her music was better than mine. And I was my music wasn't good enough for us to listen to in our relationship. So we only listen to her music. Right. What do you think happened after we broke up? I got that back. So what I'm doing with this story of Victor and his wife is I'm describing what happens when one is trying to control the other. Because when yes. Hitler didn't Hitler didn't say from day one, kill six million Jews. That was a process. Mm. OK. Hitler started by banning, you know, Jewish people from their, their jobs and, and reducing their income. Then he started taking personal liberties away from them. They could shop one hour a day. You know, they weren't allowed, you know, typewriters or cigarettes or they weren't. I mean, all of the things that Hitler did that dismantled the Jewish way of life is absolutely exposed in this in this biography, in this in this book, this memoir. In fact, right. Let me let me conclude this point about this story and then we'll move on but yeah. let me give the, the the disclaimer to what i'm about to say is i'm going to have one word in this in this in this joke that's going to be a shocking word and you will understand when i finish the joke why i use that word okay so i i'm, I'm i and please i pray to god that i don't offend anybody of the jewish faith because that is not the point of what i'm about to say so i hope nobody takes offense to this because this, 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 this concludes this whole story of Victor and his wife. A man in Berlin takes his wife to the hospital to give birth. A picture of Christ hangs over the bed. The man to the nurse, nurse that picture must go. I don't want that Jew boy to be the first thing my child sees. The nurse, she herself could do nothing about it. She will report it. That night, the man gets a telegram from the doctor. You have a son. The picture doesn't need to be removed. The child is blind. And that's called prejudice. Yeah. Okay. And that's the ignorance of people who think they know everything when they're arguing with their spouse. The difference between somebody who is intelligent and somebody who is ignorant is one of them knows they're ignorant. Yeah. And let me tell you my story and what I mean by that. Because this is this is this is my story. This is how I got involved with this. So, along with my Wall Street career, is my investment story. In parallel to my career, I started in 1993 with seven thousand dollars invested in the stock market. By January of 2000, remember, my dad was a cab driver. By January of 2000, it was twelve and a half million dollars. I was worth $12.5 million in January of 2000, and I lost almost all of that in six months mm. when the tech market turned in 2000. Yeah. Okay. I thought I knew everything. I was going to 100 million bucks. But here's the fascinating part about this story when I tell it from today's point of view. I have lived the what if every day of my life since then. Yeah. 
If I had sold in January of 2000, my portfolio, I would be worth a hundred million dollars today because it's been a no brainer on what happened since 2000 in the tech, in, 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 in the internet with Amazon and Netflix and all, yeah. you know, all those companies. It was, it was like fishing in a bathtub to make a fortune in investments if you're smart enough to do it. And I had the background to be able to do that, but I wouldn't be here talking marriage with you today if I'd be worth a million dollars. No. So when you go through these problems, you realize there's something better on the other side. Yeah. That's called oh, yeah. change, by the way. But once I realized it, the reason why I'm telling this story is so I can depreciate that $12.5 million loss and everybody else, here's my story. If I can influence one person to realize they don't know everything, I've done my job. Yes. I am promoting curiosity mm. in America. Stay curious, my friend. <laughs> no, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think, again, You've written a handbook. People ought to get hold of it. How can they get hold of it? Well, they can't. <laughs> I'm sorry to say this. They can't actually get a hold of the book because the book is my workshop. What they do, I, I have a free two-hour seminar. Okay. Let me give you my email address. It's my name, Tim Kellis at Happy Relationships, plural, dot com. Tim Kellis at happyrelationships.com. Anybody reaches out to me, I, I do require both to, to attend the seminar. So if I get both a husband and wife to attend the seminar, I will fix their marriage. But the next step is when we get into the workshop, because that's the deep, the deep work. The, the book is to, if you, go, if you go to Amazon and you look at the title of the book is Equality, The Quest for the Happy Marriage. If you go to Amazon, there's actually a, a book review of my book where the guy who supposedly read the book, his summary conclusion of my book is that I'm a disgruntled fraternity boy who's upset because my girlfriend broke up with me. That is his conclusion. No Carl Jung, no Victor Klimper, no Microsoft. There's no response to the book. He just came to this conclusion and I'm just this. So you cannot read that book without help. Which is Okay. Me. No, I, okay, I got it. So what you're saying is the book comes with the seminar or the book the comes with around. the workshop. The book with does the not workshop. come with the seminar. The seminar is my introduction to show you I know what I'm talking about. That's yes. why I go and describe the whole hierarchy argument. I get into fear and anger. I actually have couples look at each other. One calls the other a jerk. The other looks back and says, the reason why you said that is you're afraid. What are you afraid of? And then the other one says, you're right. I'm wrong. I'm sorry. I'm getting people to admit they're wrong. And I'm getting people to learn the what are you afraid of question. So once they learn that question, their marriage, the direction of their marriage has changed forever. Mm -hmm. So I need to show that first. And then the workshop is because it's a commitment. It's a two month weekly workshop. They have to read through the book. I have to make sure they're going to commit to doing the work. But if they read through that book with my help, remember a professor doesn't throw a textbook at a student and say, I'll see it to find it. Yes. The professor is there to walk people through the textbook. And that's what I'm doing. Yes. The more profound part of working with me is not the reading, but it's the explanation after the reading. But you have to do the reading first so I can explain what I'm telling you. Okay. I, I like the whole concept of that. Although, can people still purchase the book, though, on, on, on its own? There, there are books circulating around. Yeah, you can go to Amazon and buy, buy a used book. I'm yeah. not going to sell it because, you know, it, it, it becomes more uh, this, uh, um, uh, in, inefficient because if they're reading on their own and they don't know what they're reading. So let, let me give you an example. And, and so here's, here is the example I used to, to demonstrate the analogy. Okay. Yeah. What I'm doing is I'm, I'm, ex I'm, I'm introducing people to the world of analogy. So at the very beginning, when I'm describing the appropriate relationship, what I'm using is my analogy is Microsoft. Okay, yes. and anybody that knows that story knows that two people founded Microsoft, not just Bill Gates, but Paul Allen as well. Yeah. Okay, and Paul Allen is the uh, is the typical nerd. This guy has a beard down to here, worth tens of billions of dollars. He died recently, but he's worth tens of billions of dollars and never got married. This is how big of a nerd he actually lived with his mom for the longest time. Wow. And the point I'm making with that is Paul Allen is not a sales guy. Nerds don't sell, nerds develop. Paul Allen is the engineer. Bill Gates is the sales guy. Yes. 
That's a partnership. If you and I start our business, Michael, and, you, and we are both sales guys, you're, uh, you're the best salesperson on the world and I'm number two. So we are two of the best salespeople in the world. Will our business succeed? No. no. We don't have a product. What are we selling? Okay. If you and I are the same person, our business fails. But why do couples want their partner to think just like them? Okay, that's yeah. not a partnership. A partnership is not when two salespeople start the business. A partnership is when I have my skill sets and you have your skill sets. And so that's what I'm explaining when I'm describing this whole Microsoft thing. But people don't realize I had a guy that I have a, a, test, a video testimonial where a guy that finished my workshop is discussing with a guy who just finished my seminar what he learned from the workshop. And the guy begins this conversation by saying, Tim, I was really pissed off at you when I'm reading about Microsoft. Because I'm thinking to myself, what the hell does Microsoft have to do about with my marriage? Yeah. Now, he and his wife use that analogy because what I'm teaching with the Microsoft analogy is sometimes it takes time to solve problems. Yeah. Think about that. If you and I, you know, couples that are in, a, in, in, a, in an argument are going to stay there until they solve the argument. Yes. Okay. And that's where this happens. So that's when they start yelling at each other. And you get to this point where people go crazy when they get to that. They can't, they don't know how to stop. Hate begets hate. You know, the number one rule of physics is every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So when I call you a jerk, physics says you're going to call me a jerk back. That's the way it works. Yeah. And you've got to stop that progression from happening. Yeah. And that's, and that's what essence is, is what in essence the, that I'm doing is I'm is I'm getting people to be more conscious and aware of what's going on in a relationship. Got it. Got it. I it's making all sense to me now. Uh, well, not everything, obviously, <laughs> but the explanation is. So, if people wanted to come on the seminar, how would they do that? To begin, well, with? the first thing is e e email me again. Tim Callis at HappyRelationships.com. I can also tell you, if you go to Facebook and you search the marriage support group, I'm just about to get to 24,000 members. It's one of the largest wow. marriage groups in the book. I'm the founder of the group, so you can find me there as well. And you yeah. can DM me and reach out to me that way. But yeah, just reach out to me, find some way. Again, I'm all over the internet. If you search my name, you'll get, just go to YouTube and search my videos on YouTube. You know, I, I, I've got dozens and dozens of videos on there. You can find all kinds of information about me. But, you know, my right. email address is my name, Tim Callis at relationships.com, or just go to the marriage support group on Facebook and you can find me there as well. Not only that, that's a great, it's a very interactive group. One of the things I allow in that group is I allow other marriage experts to contribute. Most marriage, most groups on Facebook are created by the founder for the founder. Yes. Well, my mission is to lower the divorce rate, and I can't do that by myself. In fact, I have a private DM group with about 80 of, this is how many marriage experts are in my group. I have about 80 other marriage experts that are part of this private DM group I have, where we're all collaborating together to try and continue to get the group to be more open to getting help. But you can go to this group and you can say, here's my problem in my marriage. And you will get, I had this lady, this, the sex issue, this lady says, my husband wants sex every night. The last I checked, she had 240 comments on that one post. Yeah. 240 comments on one post. Wow. So when you go and you post, here's the problem in my marriage, you'll get people that are coming and you ever think about this, you think about this. It's a very interactive, very, I have people all the time that have told me just being part of the group has changed their marriage. Mm. Incredible. It's time. It's time. We've been in divorce for 60 years. We have been, divorce has been part of our society for 60 years now. And there's nothing out there. Men and women are not from different planets. The five love languages does not work. If you don't address marriages mentally and psychologically, which is all I've been explaining today, is addressing marriages mentally and psychologically, which is what's new. You don't address marriages mentally and psychologically. You don't fix your problems. When you do, you do fix your problems. Behavior Amazing. advice doesn't work. Can we put that statement out there in the public now? Behavior advice doesn't work. As much as the professionals are trying to force feed us behavioral advice, day at night, you're still going to fight. So when yeah. you go see a professional, they say, go on a date. You guys should go on a date together. 
we're still going to fight. You have not solved my problems by telling us to go on a date together. No. Can you give me something a little more helpful than date night to solve my marriage problems or the five love languages? In fact, here's the, here's the five love language story. If Gary Chapman wanted to write a book that was actually helpful, what he would have written was that both in the marriage should be doing all five, because remember, all five are common sense things that are part of every successful relationship. So both should be doing all five. And the one that you picked, you picked either because you didn't have it in your childhood or your spouse didn't have it in his or her childhood. And once you say that, it now all of a sudden introduces a psychological component to the discussion. Remember, psychologists aren't psychologists, they're biologists. Okay, we have 200,000 licensed therapists in this country that are not psychologists. These are 200,000 licensed biologists. Yeah. They have a psychology label on them, but they're not trained to be psychologists. They're, they're trained to be biologists, which is why they give behavioral advice. The only way you're trained to be a psychologist is if you follow Jung, not if you follow Freud. One of my goals is to ultimately replace Freud with Jung. If the psychology industry was really, if really wanted to help, if they really wanted to be helpful, they would finally move past Freud. It's about time. We all know he's an idiot. And, and everybody has been saying that for decades, that Freud's an idiot. Yet the industry still follows him because it's more profitable. Yeah. When you claim that somebody's an animal and the mental problems they have, there's nothing you can do about them, which is the whole thing. So why they label people. Yeah. Okay. Have you ever heard of the DSM? Do you know what the DSM is? Yes. Yes. I was going to mention that earlier as well. Yeah. But when you were talking about toxic, toxic happiness. Positivity. Positive, yeah, positivity. positivity. That's it. Okay. Do you know how big the DSM is, though? Huge. Yeah. I've seen it. Yeah. It's a thousand pages. Yeah, huge. That's yeah. it. The thousand pages, that's the biggest waste of paper on the planet. Because mm. none of it's true. No. And and they keep adding to it so they can develop another tablet or pill to swallow. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I'm putting my foot down. There's an industry that's supposed to be helping people and they're not. That's ridiculous. No. Well, you're... I, I mean, it's great that you've got the support group, that you've got other professionals that are also contributing, collaborating. And do you know, you know what the divorce rate is in the USA? We just use 50%. There's, it's so hard to vet because you got to remember, it's, it's a, there's no such thing as a, you know, we're going to take a snapshot today because, you know, how long we've yeah. been, all that stuff. There's, but 50%, it doesn't matter. The answer to your question, quite honestly, Michael, is for everybody to look around your own circle. Yeah, that's true. You're, you only had one divorce. Are you, are you an oddball in your, your circle or something? Everybody, was there a five divorce minimum to, to be part of your circle of friends? I mean, just we have this whole notion of divorce. We just take it. If you're not divorced, you haven't lived. Are you kidding me? We have divorce as a throwaway now. It's, we, we have abused what turns out to be something that God gives us, to be honest with you. Yes. Yeah. And it's about time we take that back. We, we, we've got to get an understanding of how to make it work. And, and the solution is the quality. It's, it's, the solution is easy, by the way. The problems are what's difficult. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, the thing is, we make it more complicated than it needs to be, cool. as always. And it sounds like, and thank you, because I, I really would love for this message to come out to all my listeners. Thank and you. because there are so many impacts of, you know, people that are struggling in their relationships, because as you said, it affects the children, it affects other people in your circle, your friends, it affects your work, it affects your everything. performance, everything. It has such a huge impact on life. Well, when this relationship for me was ending, I couldn't work. I had no focus. Are you kidding me? It destroyed my work ethic when this thing yeah. was ending. I couldn't believe it. You know, how is the, we're going to spend the rest of our lives together and now we're breaking up. It just, it, 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 does, it doesn't make sense. How do you go from being in love with somebody to breaking up? That is the, the bridge that I've, I'm gapping. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. clarifying that bridge and what causes that so that people don't take that road. That's amazing, Tim. Thank you so much you. for your time and for your wisdom. And let's hope people get the message. Let's hope they get in touch with you. 
get onto your seminar, your workshop, your group, and start to heal this thing. <laughs> you know? and, and Michael, I can't tell you how much I appreciate the opportunity to come here on your platform and for you allowing me to be able to share this with people. This is this means the world to me to be able to have an opportunity to share this with, with your audience. So I can't thank you enough for giving me this opportunity. You are very welcome. And uh, let's get it out there so people can listen to it. Thank you for thank your you very time. Much, Michael. Enjoy Delray Beach. I'm so <laughs> jealous. And uh, <laughs> come visit. Come on down. You got a, you got a place to stay. <laughs> come on oh, down. Bless you. Bless you. Okay, we'll be in touch. Take care. And um, yeah, good luck with everything. Thank you. I appreciate it, Mike. Thank you very much for your time, Michael. Thank you. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please rate, subscribe, and share at will. I'm always looking for more listeners and guests, so do get in touch, please. You can find me pretty easily by searching for Staying Alive UK. Thank you. Staying Alive UK. Share your story.